Thanks, Craig. Um, it's kind of awesome to be speaking. At, uh, everyone says, ah, oh, you can always speak at Yow. I can tell you, now, getting to Yow to speak is a really tough gig. And even if you work for the joint, it's taken me four years to get here. Um, so it's really awesome to be here. So thanks for coming along. Um, this talk is really about, uh, I actually gave this to the Scrum Gathering a, a few years ago. And it was really, I wanted Scrum folks to realize that there was more to Scrum in the world. Um, but as I started giving it some more, people said there's some really cool stuff in here. So hopefully you're going to learn something. This is going to be pretty past paced, uh, so don't try and take too many notes along the way. You can get the slides afterwards if you want any of the references of the books. But this is really because I was just sick of going at organizations and people would come up and they'd say to me, like, that's not agile, right? Or, you know, if your stand-up is 16.3 minutes, that's not agile. Um, or, you know, Craig, why aren't you being more agile? Um, there's no Bible to this thing. There's no book. And that's what actually I really love about Agile. Right? There's no big reference book that you just have to go follow. Um, but as a result, it means there's lots of methods out there. And we can learn from those. So that's what this talk is all about. So this is going to be quick. It's going to be fast paced. Try and get uh, 40 in about 40 minutes. All right, you ready for the challenge? Let's go. All right. So it'd be remiss not to start with the foundations, uh, all the foundational Agile methods. And this one doesn't even get a number, right? This is just dash, number dash, 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 but it's obviously the Agile Manifesto. We're lucky enough to have at least one of the signatories here with us at the conference in Dave Thomas. That's pragmatic Dave Thomas, not the real Dave Thomas. Apparently the real Dave Thomas, uh, or, the, or Yao Dave Thomas, uh, told me that he could have gone there. It's just that uh, he wanted to be in the Caribbean and didn't want to go to the snow. So he didn't go to the, uh, the Agile Manifesto meeting. But these uh, 17 middle-aged white men got together on a mountain in Utah and said, you know, let's dream this thing up. And I'd like to think they did it in a hot tub, but apparently they did it in a meeting room. But they came up with this thing. And this was an agreement about, um, you know, how we should start to develop software and has really now just become a way that we develop stuff. So this is the foundation. I'm sure you've all seen it before. Um, but let's go to some of the other foundational methods because they actually, you know, the manifesto, these things predated it and Scrum is one of them. It's not this kind of Scrum, but our Agile Scrum. Um, actually came, came about in 1996 uh, between Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber. Uh, but actually it originated even uh, earlier than that from a paper called the New New Product Game or New New Development Game by a couple of Japanese guys that I can't pronounce. Um, and these guys looked at that and they went, that sounds pretty good, let's kind of use that. And that's where Scrum came from. Um, it's essentially referenced in the Scrum Guide. There was an original black book which you can read, although it's fairly out of date now. The Scrum Guide's available through both the Scrum Alliance and Scrum.org. Uh, but this is what a lot of us understand Agile to be. And really great if you're doing iterative type process. Iterative processes are great if you're heading for a date, if you're heading for a cost or a, or a timeline. Um, and around about 76% of the teams in most of the surveys that go around suggest they're doing some sort of Scrum. Um, so it's very popular. Uh, however, there are some negatives to it. Um, obviously, certification is a big bane of existence. Um, and now there's two organizations, Scrum.org and Scrum Alliance. One makes you certified, one makes you a professional. Don't know the difference. Um, there's no technical practices in here, which is a bit of a shame. And it's very small team focused, but very popular. Going on from that, there's something called Scrum But, right? or Scrum And. And some of you might fall into this. If you haven't heard of Scrum But, this is when you go, we do Scrum But. We do four-week sprints. Right? We do Scrum, but um, we can replace anything else. Kanban, but, Agile, but, the same type of things. Um, and this term was uh, coined by Eric Gunnison uh, a few years ago. Ken Schwaber picked up on this. And, and actually, this is what a lot of people don't appreciate about the Scrum community. He said, well, it's not about being you know, just Scrum. It's about evolving to what we call Scrum and. And that's when you can actually say, I do Scrum and I look at this DevOps stuff. I do Scrum and I look at other things outside. So it's about extending our knowledge. So don't fall into Scrum, but. Extreme programming, XP, not that XP, right, but this XP here. Um, came out in 1996, popularized by a bunch of guys out of uh, Chrysler, where they sort of tried this stuff out. But Kent Beck is probably best known because he was behind the book Extreme Program Explained, uh, Embrace Change. The white one's the one to read. There was a second edition green one, which I don't like very much. Um, still one of the best books to read. Still holds up, even though it's uh, almost 20 years old. Um, and it was all about the technical practices. Um, there's a whole bunch of principles and values in here. It talks about planning. You know, if you haven't gone and you know, re sort of had a look at the XP book, go take a look. Some really good stuff and very lightweight stuff in there. The thing about XP though is a lot of teams don't actually say they do extreme programming anymore, and that's because the practices in here have just become good software engineering best practice. We don't call them agile practices anymore. Right? Test-driven development, continuous integration, they have just become good practice. Um, but still worthwhile going have a look at for your team because there's some really good stuff in there and it's, very, it's a very easy read. And there's a whole set of books behind it. 
Crystal is one that you may or may not have heard of, popularized by Alistair Coburn, who was one of the signatories. He wrote a book on uh, Crystal Clear, which is one of the variants of it, but actually there's a whole bunch of colors behind Crystal. You've got Crystal Yellow, Crystal Orange, Crystal Red, Crystal Magenta, Crystal Blue. Craig was actually telling me before that uh, he's had Alistair Coburn explain Crystal to him, and even he can't explain it, which is probably why it never really took off. But it's one of these what we call non-jealous agile methods because it says go and get stuff from other places and use it. And that's what Crystal's really good at, about. But these colors are interesting because this was one of the first uh, methods that actually took scaling into consideration. It actually said that we know we're going to have big projects, we know we're going to have big teams, and in fact, more importantly, that color code is actually we're also going to have projects that are going to have different risk profiles. So there's some really interesting things that we can go back and learn from here. It accounts for life-critical projects. So if you're doing things like health or uh, those type of projects, it deals for cross-functional teams. Um, uh, but the problem with it is, is that if you choose the method that you're using, for example, Crystal Orange, uh, you can't easily go back to another method. So you're kind of locked in once you choose it, which is a bit of a, uh, I guess, a problem with the, uh, the whole methodology itself. It requires co-located teams. In fact, that's at its heart. Um, and it does need some discipline because it is very lightweight. But again, there's lots of things we can learn by going back and just having a look at this. And a lot of Alistair's work moving forward, um, and he comes out here quite regularly. I think he's back out again at the beginning of the year. Uh, a lot of these things are built on what he talked about in Crystal. DSDM. This one was really big in Europe back in the day. Uh, 1994 by the DSDM uh, uh, Association. It was called DSDM a, a turn for a while, but they've gone back to just DSDM again. Uh, and this, as I said, was one of the early Agile methods, very popular in certain parts of the world. Um, but you may recognize some of the things that we've taken from it. Some of you may have heard of something called the Moscow approach right, to, to doing prioritization. This comes from DSDM. Right? It's popularized in what a lot of us know Agile in Australia, but it comes from here. And so a lot of the processes and practices that we use actually come from DSDM. So it's a worthwhile thing going and look at um, because it's got a lot of focus on planning. It talks about stakeholders. It's got a real key importance on testing, which is great. But unfortunately, it's very heavyweight. Unfortunately, you do have to put your hand in your pocket to actually go and read the whole thing, and it's not very common uh, anymore. It's still kicking around. Uh, there is an open DSDM as well, uh, but it's kind of, again, you know, sort of moved on a little bit. But lots of things that we've reused in the Agile community have come from DSDM. Feature-driven development, which is the Australian Agile method. Jeff DeLuca, uh, from right here in Melbourne, came up with this in 1997. And some of you may have used parking lot diagrams for a way of showing feature progress. This comes from DSDM. Uh, sorry, from, uh, from FDD. Um, there's lots of best practices that we use in here. He's used a lot of color model modeling and things like that. I had a whole bunch of best practices. Things if you see here on the, on the table here, you know, domain mapping, uh, class ownership, feature teams. They're all things that actually came out in 1997 out of uh, FDD. The problem with it though is it's dead. Right? You go to the website, it even hardly works now. Um, it, it's focused very much on a lot of large upfront modeling, so a lot of that big design that we kind of got away from. But it has some good stuff, it had a lot of scaling in there, and very much if you're looking for things around milestone reporting, reporting up to management, um, a lot of that stuff is in there. So it's still worth a look, and a lot of things that we've carried on from this, even though this has died away a little. Adaptive software development. This was popularized by Jim Highsmith back in 1992. Again, this one's kind of died away a little bit, but for a lot of you, you might be uh, familiar with different cycles that we have in Agile, concept, initiate, deliver, deploy, um, you know, speculate and collaborate type sessions. This really came from the work that Jim did uh, back in the early 90s in his adaptive software development approach. Um, he introduced terms like the edge of chaos. He introduced things like charters, uh, you know, which are the things that we do to kick off projects. So a lot of that stuff that we know came from this. Unfortunately, it's very uncommon and dead. The only thing that really kind of sticks around is the book now. The rest of it kind of moved away. Um, even the website went around. But the nice thing is he's moved it on to adaptive leadership, and that's what uh, he's spending a lot of his time talking about now. Um, the other thing is, is that you often hear of, in Agile the term of good enough, and that's, uh, that's also come from the work of Jim. So well worth a look. So there's some of our foundations that, that built it. Um, but as we've been moving forward, we've been thinking about different things, and one of those is lean. Uh, so it'd be remiss not to mention lean in an Agile talk. And the one that we're probably most familiar with is right, all these leans, and I couldn't fit them all on the page. But there's lean, lean manufacturing, lean enterprise, Toyota production system, lean product development. They all fit in here. And this actually goes all the way back to 1850, back to Eli Whitney and his very early writings about manufacturing. But probably popularized by Toyota, Toyoko Ono, back in the 30s, and a lot of iterations until finally James Womack probably really brought it to the masses in 1990 when he, when he wrote the awesome book, The Machine, Machine That Changed the World, which essentially took it and said, how can we learn from Toyota? How can we learn from those manufacturing processes? So there's many learnings from us out of this, and a lot of things, again, that we know in Agile and Lean um, have really come from the, the writings of these guys. 
The problem with this work though, however, it is very manufacturing process, process, uh, process orientated. Um, it can be difficult to adapt to our knowledge work. And so luckily a few people have taken that on board. Um, and metrics are a very big thing. So that's one thing you learn when you read through this. But things like Carter, lean principles, all this came from lean. Now luckily somebody did go and map this stuff out to software. And so the Pop and Deeks, and if you've been to Yale for a few years, you would have seen them at uh, Yale conferences previously, they were at last year. They took all the lean principles and applied them to software. And they came up with seven principles, 22 tools, and took all those lean manufacturing approaches and said, this is how you do it. And they've got a series of book, books, about three books, and they've actually moved on now to take these learnings and then now apply them to leadership and mindset. So the whole series of books really takes that lean thinking type approach. Um, so it's great that someone's done that mapping. Number eight, and this is something you should have in your toolkit, is Deming. Right, if you haven't heard of Deming, uh, worth taking a look. This dates back to 1939. So old you can get the book for free, right, uh, because it's, uh, it's out of copyright. Um, out of the Crisis is kind of the book. He's got a bunch of other ones, though. Um, but this is where the idea of systems thinking comes in. It's about thinking about uh, your approach, your process, your organization as a system. Um, and we really call Deming the father of a lot of the ideas we have today, not just in Agile, but lots of things. You may have heard of the uh, plan, do, check, act cycle. He actually called it the plan, do, study, act cycle because he wanted to inspe uh, emphasize inspection over analysis. Um, he's got 14 principles for management, and, there, you know, and if I thought you know, my managers would actually take those 14 points on, we'd have a pretty good place. Um, but well worth going and taking a look at, a lot of our stuff builds on from this. This is really a building block. I don't really want to say a lot about this one because you're going to be hearing from this guy this, uh, this afternoon, which is awesome, but Don Reiniston um, has taken a lot of uh, this sort of lean work and applied this in his uh, book, The Principles of Product Development Flow. Um, and really, the way I describe uh, uh, Don is, is that he's the guy that essentially explains how Agile and Lean works. He's got the mathematics behind it, he's got the explanation behind it. If you're ever wondering how you're going to prove it out, the evidence is uh, in all this work. The problem, however, with Don's work, and he would actually say this as well, there's 175 principles in this book and it's 300 pages long. I've read it 17 times and I'm still struggling to get through it. I've sat through his workshop twice. Um, it's one of those books you just can't read from beginning to end, but every time you dip into it, there's always something to learn. Um, the other thing is he doesn't provide any specific techniques in there. Uh, it's, that's for you to take back. But again, if you ever want to try, try to explain it, this is where you want to go. And luckily, we get to see him this afternoon, so that's awesome. Kanban, or what has been referred to as modern management methods now because there was a bit of a fallout in the Kanban community. Um, but David J. Anderson in 2010 really took the idea of the lean Kanban approach and applied that to software or to uh, modern management methods. Um, it's based on four principles. And if you actually read those principles at the top, uh, the first three were chosen specifically because they're not emotional change driven. Right? Start with what you do now. In other words, you're doing stuff good. Uh, agree to pursue incremental evolutionary change. Who wouldn't want that? You know, respect the current process roles and responsibilities. So the wording was very specific in here. It's, and obviously the whole point behind Kanban is that we're moving away from this iterative process to the fact that things work in flow. So there's a whole bunch of properties like visualization, limiting work in progress, those type of things. Um, it's very simple um, and it, it certainly uh, does things like keeps your bottlenecks visible, um, you know, work in progress is very important, but it does require a lot of discipline. Right? Teams often say they're doing Kanban and aren't because they're not doing all the disciplines. It's often misunderstood in that respect and the problem is the community is a little fracturing you know, even by the fact that you see that the names change. Um, but certainly it's one of the cornerstone uh, approaches. Personal Kanban, so obviously this is just taking Kanban and applying it to one. Uh, so this was popularized by Jim Benson um, and Toriana. Uh, they essentially were working um, with the Kanban guys originally, but took, went down the path of doing it for one. So it's the same stuff, but doing it for a team of one. I do personal Kanban, I'm a team of one, I'm awesome. Right? Um, but it's something if you are working on your own uh, that you might want to go and take a look at, that focus on the individual. Lean startup. Right? It's often been described that Kanban is the wave that's following on behind uh, Iterative Agile, then Lean startup is a tsunami. Right? This is uh, essentially was popularized by Eric Ries in 2008, although Steve Blank did a lot of work in, in this space before him. And this is where all the terms that we now talk about now, minimal viable product, continuous deployment, A-B testing, pivoting, uh, all was really popularized uh, by the Lean startup uh, type approach. And the thing that a lot of people are starting to realize now is that this just doesn't ap apply to startups, but it also applies to our large organizations where we can do more entrepreneurship as opposed to entrepreneurship. Um, this was a New York Times bestseller. No Agile book ever has been a New York Times bestseller. Um, so this has actually got Agile to the masses. But the interesting thing is if you see that little diagram of the process there, the build, measure, learn loop, 
There's a little dot point in there somewhere. Somewhere in the middle of the book, it just says, well, of course you're doing Agile. Right? So in order to build on this, you have to have those Agile principles in place. Um, there is some hype around this, which is just something to look out for. And there's very much a focus on features, not products. So minimal viable product is really actually, here's a feature. Let's see if you use it or not. And loses that product approach. So just be a little aware if you're going down that path. There are also what we call some, some extensions. And there's a whole bunch of people who are just trying to make a buck out of taking the same things and rebadging them. So we've got Scrumban, we've got Zanpan, we've got Nonban, we've got Water Scrumfall. Um, <laughs> Scrumban is just putting Scrum and Kanban together. Genius, he sold a book, he made a fortune. Um, and the same thing with Zanban is XP and Kanban. Nonban says this is all crap and it's just, you know, the only thing is that slide up there, which essentially says, you know, it's, it's not about process, it's about doing the work, which actually I agree with. Um, but the one that I really like is the Water Scrum Fall, which Dave West from Forrester coined. Because a lot of us are really good at the middle part. We're really good at delivering software. The problem is we get let down at the front of the process, and we often get down, left down at the end of the process. Now, luckily, DevOps has picked up the end of the process. We've still got a little bit of work to do at the front. So we're very good at the middle, but maybe, you know, in your organization, maybe you're in this Water Scrum Fall type approach. This one's Scrum Plop. <laughs> Bad name. But this one is about a pattern library around Scrum. And this one is just not as well known as I think it should be. It's a pattern language of a whole bunch of Scrum stuff. It's sharing experiences. So people in the Scrum community get in here and they go, I've seen these things. This is how I did it. And this is a whole open wiki. You can just go in and, uh, and read this stuff. You can also submit to it. And they apparently have an annual Scrum Pop conference where they actually go and review all this stuff. Um, the problem is not many people know about it, so therefore it's not widely contributed to. Um, and they do have a uh, review cycle in order to get stuff in. They do it annually, which to me sounds very waterfall, but um, it's well worth taking a look if you're just after some ideas. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. The other thing we uh, often think about is how do we take a whole organization on the journey? So there's been a lot of approaches now to people thinking about the agile transformation. This is just one of them um, by a company called Agile 42 um, called their ETF or Enterprise Transition Framework. Um, the thing I like about this is it's got all the major scaling approaches in there, um, but Agile 42 is a consultant company, so there's some consultancy behind this. Um, and there's nothing really new in here. There's also been some uh, more previous work. Sanjeev Augustine, for example, just wrote a new book that tries to put a lot of these approaches together. But you don't have to start from nothing. There's a lot of this stuff written, and so this one's not a bad one just to take a look at for a starting point. Uh, again, I won't say too much about this because uh, uh, the guy behind this is uh, here at the conference and will be talking about this tomorrow, but Dan North um, used to call this Accelerated Agile. It's now called Software Faster. Um, this is really awesome because uh, uh, Dan's been around the, uh, uh, in the industry for a long time and he's got a lot of experiences about how to do this stuff really well, how to do this stuff at scale, how to do it really fast. Um, and he shares this uh, you know, in his workshops. The problem is, is that he hasn't really documented so well. Right? You've got to go to his workshop or his talk. He's got a few blog posts, and uh, there is a book coming, so he tells me. Um, and it's just a mix of random thoughts. But he's trying to put patterns to the things that we just see and trying to do software better. So uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're around tomorrow, well worth going and seeing Dan's talk. And uh, his workshops are awesome about that as well. And we look forward to the book. We've taken our knowledge of extreme programming to uh, the world of cars, and this is what we call extreme manufacturing or wiki speed. Uh, this is Joe Justice, he's an agile coach, but he's also a car enthusiast, and he actually uh, went and did an XPRIZE competition to build a car engine that would get 100 miles to a gallon. Um, but because he was an agile guy, he says, I'm going to build this car agile. And so they rebuilt the car every seven days using scrums, using scrum masters, all these type of things. And that's kind of cool, and you can go watch the videos on that, but the really cool thing about this, however, is now some other companies are taking notice. Now, there's a little company called John Deere, they make tractors. Right? They're starting to look at this because they've had massive overruns in tractors. Another little company you may have heard of them called Boeing. Right? They're looking at some of these practices because they're having cost runs in, in their, a lot of their previous aircraft as well. So it's taking what we've learned and now applying it back to the manufacturing area. Problem is, again, not so well documented, a bunch of videos and blogs, um, but uh, you know, it's starting to grow. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the certifications, not necessarily because I condone them. Uh, we all have our own uh, thoughts about whether these are right or wrong. But the fact is there's a lot of work in different areas. So if you're trying to get project managers along the way, PMI have an Agile uh, certification or extension. Prince2 has one. It took them about seven years to get it out, which is how Prince2 projects work. Um, IIBA have had one for a while for business analysis called the BABOC. And people like IC Agile, uh, who are kind of a little bit independent, uh, also have certifications. So a lot of these are good reference points, even if you don't do the certification, to look at the learning objectives or the things that have been written behind them uh, to learn a little more. 
So scale seems to be the hot word in, uh, in Agile. So uh, there is a whole bunch of approaches. And one of the early ones was this thing called the Agile Unified Process, or AUP. I only mention it, it's actually deprecated. I only mention it as a bit of background, but it was a good early example of dealing with scale. In fact, it goes all the way back to 2005. Um, the thing is, however, that this was popularized by Scott Ambler, who's a great guy, but he comes from the RUP world. Does anyone remember RUP, Rational Unified Process? Right? It was a great process, but no one could follow it. You need Egyptians to help you count the books around behind you. Um, you, know, you had to pay you know, lots of money to get into it. They tried to take RUP to Agile, didn't quite work. So Scott had another crack at it, and he came up with this thing called Disciplined Agile Delivery, or DAD. And you can see on here, it's um, popularized out of IBM. The interesting thing, though, is that everyone I talk to IBM says we don't use it, so I don't really know who does. Um, but there's some really cool stuff in here. Um, some of the key aspects, it's about people first, it's about a full delivery life cycle, it's very enterprise aware. Um, so there's some really good learnings out of here. And some of the things is they have some good coverage of things that other frameworks don't have. They talk a lot about governance, they talk a lot about DevOps and architecture, things that are often missed. But it's still very heavyweight. You can see RUP in its implementation if you look really carefully. It hasn't had a lot of market adoption. And there's a lot of prescriptiveness in there. So it's just something to look out for. But what we're taking a look at if you're, if you're looking at scaling methods, because there are some things to learn. And the interesting thing is, is that what they've taken this onto now is something called EUP, or the Enterprise Unified Process. And this is still a bit of a work in progress. So it, there's an original book by Scott back in 1999. So this even predates the, the AUP stuff I talked about before. But they're starting to retrofit this now to Agile. And the interesting thing is, is that they're actually starting to look at other things that nobody seems to talk about, like how do you decommission applications? Um, you know, how do you deal with issues in the enterprise? How do you deal with things like HR? Those type of things. So it's well worth taking a look at because it's got that full end-to-end -end enterprise stack. So just to look and see what their thoughts are around it. But obviously out of date, you just don't pick this up and follow it. So there's been a whole bunch of approaches to scaling, and one of them is this thing called LESS, the Large Scale Scrum Framework, which has actually been around for a long while. Craig Lahman and Baz Vode uh, wrote a couple of books back in 2008 um, and later. These two books, which are actually some of my Bibles as an Agile coach, because they're really the first books that actually dealt with scale. Um, more recently, in the last year, they've actually gone back and re-kind of worked this and came up with this idea of less, which is up to eight teams, and what I think is the not so well named less huge, which is uh, for going up to a few thousand people. Um, it's very good because it's based on Scrum and it's very lightweight. Um, it talks very much about product owners and you know assuming that you're not going to have hundreds of those in your organisation, which I think is really cool. Um, and their website is really good to look at. Um, it's getting a growing adoption. It's still small, but growing. There are some, uh, some people doing some good work with it here in this country as well as uh, elsewhere. And they are writing a new book, which is uh, kind of still coming. The original books are a little dated. They don't have the same diagrams in there, but actually still hold up really well. So well worth a look if you're trying to scale. There's a thing called Enterprise Scrum, which some of you may not have heard of, which is the work by someone called Mike Beadle. And what he did is he tried to take Scrum but apply it to the business context. And what he's done is applied all the Scrum names and said, well, let's talk about that in business speak. And so it's a really good reference to go and look and see um, uh, the business skin of Scrum. Um, so it's got the things that we know, but in words that the business can understand. So you can apply it to all sorts of other areas of the organization, uh, other knowledge areas, people like your HR departments, your finance departments. Um, there's a really good PDF behind this, um, which you can get off the website. There is a book coming. Um, Amazon said it's kind of, has it been coming for about the last year or so, so I don't know when it's actually going to finally ship, um, but hopefully soon. But we're taking a look at if you're trying to apply agile principles outside of your software teams. Now, I couldn't do a scaled uh, talk without mentioning SAFE, or the Scaled Agile Framework, um, which uh, was popularized by Dean Leffingwell. Again, he comes from a RUP background. Um, and he drew this big diagram that even though I've read 16 times, I still can't understand. Um, Scrum is this little thing down in the bottom corner down here, and the rest of it is how you scale across the organization. Um, people like it because it's safe, right? It's uh, how you can take a waterfall organization and start to move them towards agile. But anybody who's in this space will tell you is that this is not the end game. And so there's a lot of uh, toing and froing in the agile community about you know, how good this thing actually is. And unfortunately, people take it as prescriptive. And as you can see up there, you just end up with something worse than what you already had. Um, but it is a big picture. It is active involvement. It is easy to sell because of the name. Um, but uh, you know, just look out for it, I guess. It's, uh, it's one of those things in the community we're still going. We haven't solved the scaling problem just yet. Um, and they do recommend a certification because it's a certification. Um, Spotify. Um, this is not the Spotify method, by the way. Um, Henrik Nyberg, who 
popularized it but didn't invent it. In fact, it's all the people at Spotify who did this. Um, but if you've heard of things like tribes and squads and chapters, uh, this all comes from uh, work that Spotify were doing where they were just trying to figure out how do we just get stuff done. Um, they've got some really great engineering stuff out there as well, some great videos about their culture. Um, and they're an organization that continues to adapt. In fact, they are really an agile organization because they're continuously improving. The thing about this, the positives, it works well for Spotify. It may or may not work well for you. Some organizations have done this very successfully, others struggle with it. Uh, it's well regarded, it works with distributed teams, which builds on from the talk we saw a little earlier. But there's a little limited documentation about this. There are some flow on books that are starting to come out now, um, and it's not a framework, it's just a shared experience. So you have to read it like that. But again, well taking a look at things you might learn for your organization. And the most recent one is this thing called the Nexus Framework, which is not an Android phone, but um, a build on from Scrum. Um, Ken Schwab is behind this. Um, and if you look at this diagram, it looks exactly like Scrum, because it is. In fact, all he's done is shove the word Nexus in front of stuff. Right? Nexus Sprint Planning, Nexus Sprint Backlog, Nexus Sprint Review. Um, there's some reason behind this, because it's the exoskeleton. And he's taken things like the Scrum of Scrums, which people didn't really understand properly, and called it now a Nexus Integration Team. Um, but the interesting thing about this, if you're doing Scrum, this just helps you very easily start to scale, right? And you have uh, one or more teams. In fact, he says it's kind of three to nine teams. It actually you know, seems to work reasonably well as long as you don't want to do anything smart. Um, so these integration teams here, um, it's very new. There's not a lot of reported usage, and there's not a lot of guidance in here. And the benefit is it's built, built on Scrum. The disadvantage is it's built on Scrum. So you might as well vary, but worth a look. Uh, it's, only a, it's a free book, and it's only about 19 pages long. Development testing, we're a development conference, so I wouldn't get out of here alive if I didn't talk about some of this stuff, right? So DevOps obviously is one of the methods that we, we have to talk about because it is an approach. It's that fall part that we were talking about earlier. Um, based upon what we call the three ways, the first way, which is just getting the performance of your system working, the second way, which is to create feedback loops, both left and right, and the third way, which is then building on continual experimentation. Um, obviously very popular right now, it's the next evolution as we uh, take Agile across the enterprise. Popularized by Patrick Dubois, um, who came up with the term. But book-wise, you really need to go and look at uh, the books by Michael Nygaard, who's uh, been a regular speaker at Yale, uh, by Jez Humble, and he's uh, continuous to delivery books, um, as well as Gene Kim and the uh, Phoenix Project, if you're after some more information. Um, so this is about getting faster stuff downstream. There's no point you know, kind of building a whole bunch of crap and then not being able to ship it. Right? You uh, kind of want to get it down the line now to your customers. It's about uh, collaboration and community. But as I said, no definitive source. And whatever you do, don't mistake this as a role department. Right? DevOps isn't, let's have a DevOps team. Right? It's an approach. Right? So, um, and it's also not about no ops. It's not about getting rid of operations either. Programmer Anarchy. So uh, again, if you've uh, been to recent Yows, you might remember Fred George. He talked about this at Yow a number of years ago. Coined in 2010, this is developer-driven development. Right? This is saying, you know what? All that stuff that's crossed out is all crap. Right? Right. Who needs stand-ups? Who needs story cards? Who needs narratives, retrospectives, iterations? In fact, we don't even testing. Get rid of that. Right? It's pretty awesome. Right? It says, hey, let's get rid of managers. We don't need them. Right? We're developers. We're awesome. Um, it's lightweight. And it actually works well for some companies. Forward, uh, who uh, Fred worked for in the UK, um, has done uh, some good stuff with this. GitHub is another example of a company that's taken this on. Problem is, those limited reference material, it requires very highly skilled discipline teams. Right, and that's why it works. This team knew what they were building so well. They knew their, 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 uh, their collaboration so well. They knew their product. They knew their team that they can do that. Because right? there's no testing or planning in there. So if you know stuff really well, we don't often need these other scaffolding things around the outside. But for some of us, we need those to help us along the way. But again, it's a, it's a good look at where we might be able to get to. The Mercado method. So if you're doing refactoring, one of the things that's really hard to figure out in refactoring is where do you start? Where do we start with this whole problem? And the Mercado method looks at that child game, you might know it as pick up sticks, where it's like, which stick do you pick up? And if you pick one up, what happens? You move all the others. So Mercado is an agile method for dealing with refactoring, dealing with technical debt. Um, it's a process for effective refactoring. It's built on this idea of setting a goal, experimentation, visualization, and then undoing what uh, all the scaffolding had around the outside. So very development focused, but you have to build in time to do this. But if you've been doing refactoring, you know that anyway. So all worth a look if you haven't actually gone and looked at this, because someone's actually found a best practice for doing refactoring. Heard of pair programming? All right, that's old hat. That was XP. This is mob programming. This is not two people around a computer. This is, see the picture in the middle? This is seven people sitting around a computer. One machine, right? It's pair swapping every 15 minutes, right? Even the project manager codes, the tester codes, the UX person codes. 
It's awesome. Right, my friend Woody Zool is uh, behind this. He actually works for a sprinkler factory somewhere in the nowhere USA somewhere. Um, I didn't even know sprinklers had software, but there you go. Um, and they were looking for an approach to work on and they came up with this. And you see Woody speak, you go watch his videos, you're almost convinced, he almost sells you the Kool-Aid. Right? At 40 minutes through the, th uh, through the presentation, you're going, you know what, I think I might do me some more programming. Right? And then he says in the last three minutes, by the way, don't do this. <laughs> and you go, well, I just watched this for. And the thing is, and this is the learning behind it, this was all built on continuous improvement, retrospectives. This was a team that kept looking for something that worked for them, and this was something that worked for them. So there's a lot of learnings about this, about the things they were able to do, and in fact, the quality and the speed of their software is far better than what they were before. But it's a learning process, so well worth a look. Um, but there are lots of organisations now that are actually starting to take this on, having you know, great success with it. So we will be hearing more about this, I think. And then we've got the DDDs, right? TDD, ATDD, BDD, SBE, right? all sorts of different acronyms. We can go back to Kent Beck and blame him for that, test-driven development. We can blame Dan, you'll find him in the corridor, blame him for the uh, whole BDD type stuff. And then Goiko Adzik, who was uh, out last year here at Yao, um, for his whole specification by example. But really the point behind this is about trying to get quality at the core, but more importantly, just getting people to talk. Right? Getting the analysts, getting the testers, getting the developers to talk together so we can get rid of all these specifications and big upfront documentation. So it's about early collaboration. So when you read any of these books, they don't talk about tools. Right? There are plenty of tools out there to support this, things like Cucumber, Specflow, those type of tools, but these things are actually tool agnostic. This is more about the process. So even though they've got the word test in there, um, this is really about beginning with the end in mind, and testing is just one part of that. Um, so well worth looking at it. But disadvantages, right, you need that close collaboration. If you don't have that, then this is going to uh, fail dramatically for you. Um, and there is a lot of misunderstanding of terms out there. In fact, you talk to Goiko, you talk to Dan, and even they don't have it necessarily a common understanding about you know, where the things begin and end, which is, a, which is a little bit confusing if you're trying to pick this stuff up, but well worth a look. In the testing field, they've been doing stuff for a number of years. This thing's called context-driven testing from the testing school of thought. This goes back all the way to 2001. Who knew testers were doing interesting stuff in 2001? Um, but James Bark is kind of one of the cornerstones behind this, but Kem Kainer, Brian Marrick, who was one of the manifesto signatories, Brett Petticord, all behind this. Um, and what they said is actually, you know, we want uh, testing right, to have context. We want to test in a way that actually gives us some best practice to be you know, kind of awesome. Um, it's really aligned to agile testing if you think about it. When you go and read these uh, sort of statements here, you kind of go, that's agile testing. They'll tell you it's not, but it's exactly it. And the main thing is it considers testing as a skill, not a process, which is really the heart behind testing. But it's not a technique, it's not a school of thought. There's not a lot written on it. And the thing is this community, I mean, there's still context-driven um, testing conferences going on, but they're very closed community. Getting in is, is really hard, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but there's a lot of the things that are moving in the testing movement has often come from this school. So if you're looking for agile testing, go and find some context-driven testers uh, to help you out. Leadership. So there's a lot of things happening in leadership, and this one's called the Vanguard Method, which has uh, sort of been rising in popularity, popularized by John Seddon all the way back in 1985, um, but has some relevance to the agile community. Um, but this is very much around service or service organisations. So if you're an organisation that delivers services, this is something really to go, go and take a look at. It has a lot in there about systems thinking. You'll see the principles. Right? I, I, I struggle to fit them all on the slide here, so you're going to have to look at them in your own time. But a lot of these are very agile-like in, um, in their implementation. Um, there is a bit of performance and morale focus, um, and which a lot of the other methods don't have. But it's very heavy theory. If you think that's bad, go try and read it. And unfortunately, in order to get into this, you do have to go and uh, put your hand in your pocket and pay some money. But there is some interesting things to learn from this, um, and people going down this path get some really good results. So it may or may not be for you, but it's worth going and taking a bit of a look at. Other things people have been playing around with is uh, this idea of how we structure organisations, and this is just one such example, which is called Holacracy. Um, the reason I've got shoes up there, it's been popularised by the shoe company Zappos, which is um, you know, a well-known uh, company now owned by Amazon. Um, but this was popularised by Brian Robertson all the way back in 2006. He's just recently released a book in the last few months. And this is really about you know, flattening the whole organisation and actually just saying, you know what, anyone can make decisions, anyone can get stuff done as long as we know what the, the method is. And Zappos are really that poster child at the moment. And there's been some mixed results. Um, you know, a lot of people are you know, criticising, a lot of people are kind of looking on the outside. Um, but there's been a lot of work in this space. In fact, there's a, another popular book by a guy named Frederick Liu. Uh, called Reinventing Organisations, which also starts to think about some of this. So people are thinking about how do we actually structure organisations. 
thing I don't like about Holacracy though, um, the customer is just missed in here somewhere. Right? We've always forgotten the customers are important somewhere. You hope that's kind of in the conversation, but they don't really have a voice. Um, it requires an absolute full organizational transformation to do. You can't just sneak up on it. You've got to make a decision to go. And the case studies are minimal um, around this. And you know, the fact it's got a constitution kind of worries me a little bit um, when you read it. It does feel a little bit brainwashy um, when you go through it, but still things we can learn from it. Another method that's uh, worth taking a look at is this idea of right shifting. I call it an idea, it's not even a method, I guess. Um, but Bob Marshall, who's uh, you know, one of these guys, if you, if you mention the word agile on Twitter somewhere, he'll come and flame you at some point. Um, yeah. um, but he's got this uh, whole thing, he's flow chain sensei on, uh, on Twitter. But he's got this idea of right shifting, which is essentially taking any idea and saying, well, look to the right, what would happen? Um, it's all these models, and there's a whole bunch of them up here. For example, you know, it looks at software development lifecycle models and says that, well, you know, we started over on the left, and as we move towards agile and beyond, right, that's right shifting, right? You get more effective. Um, and he does the same thing for a whole bunch of stuff. He does it for HR, he does it for uh, storytelling, he does all sorts of cool stuff. So it's worth taking a look at. Um, I kind of look at it and I go, well, duh. Right? Um, and that's kind of when you read it, but sometimes it just gives you some ideas about where you might want to actually make some change. Um, so that's really the, uh, the, the cool thing about it. But it's only a model. The reference material really just exists on his blog, um, but it is kind of a bit of a movement that, uh, that some people are starting to think about. When you're thinking about changing stuff, one of the things that most Agile teams really complain about is this whole idea about how do we deal with the, the money and the cost and the budgeting. And so this idea of beyond budgeting has been around for a while. In fact, it dates back to 1998 with these three guys on the left-hand side here when they wrote a book called Beyond Budgeting, but probably more recently, Beate Bognus, who came out with uh, implementing Beyond Budgeting. Um, and this is kind of where, uh, in the Agile community, we've been looking at the, uh, at the bean counters and going, you guys suck. We hate budgeting. We hate having to come up with estimates. The interesting thing is that the accountants on the other side go, you IT guys suck, right? You're, you, know, you want us to you want to give us all these big upfront estimates. And we go, well, we never wanted that. In fact, the interesting story is Beate ran into an Agile conference somewhere when he was uh, at another conference, kind of looked in and went, that looks interesting. And they went, we like what you're doing. And we said, we like what you're doing. All of a sudden, it came together. So this is budgeting, but coming from the accounting, accounting side. Now, there are these, uh, these principles behind here. There's uh, 12 principles there. Only one of them has to do with money. The other 11 of them are about trust, about management. In fact, budgeting is all about lack of trust. So beyond budgeting is about how you can actually have a process that stands up accounting-wise, but actually builds that trust in the process. Um, it's also about reducing management complexity, which is really, you know, budgeting puts all that kind of stuff on there, but has all those financial controls behind it. The downside is, is if you want to really dig into it past the books, you do have to kind of throw some money on the table, because they are accountants after all. Um, and it does require some cultural change. It's usually past where we're at, but worth taking a look at. So if you've got organizations that are starting to move down the progressive funding route, this is really something to go and take a, take a look at behind the scenes. Management is also something that's been changing. There's a whole bunch of things in this space. I've just picked Steve Denning's work, but there are a whole bunch of them. He came up with a book called Radical Management. Um, his whole thing is about delighting the customer. In fact, his book's got 70 principles about good leadership and, and how to move through. Um, he writes a lot for Forbes, so you can find a lot of that stuff online. But it's about getting more productive, high-performing teams from, and, and uh, nurturing those from a leadership perspective, but also about busting all, of, all the red tape and stuff that happens in organizations. Um, the problem is that this hasn't quite filtered all the way through into the management school, so you know, unfortunately it's going to take us a few years to get this you know, really kind of you know, through the chain, and uh, like everything else, requires a cultural change. Stoos is an interesting one, right? So these guys went, I know what we could do. We could go, go up on a mountaintop and go and design something cool. Right? Sounds, sounds like something we've done before. Um, so in 2012, these guys went to a mountaintop, except they went to Austria or somewhere, um, to this place called Stoos. Um, and they started to think about, well, how can we actually find better ways of leading organizations, right, building on stuff. And so there was 21 attendees there who went and did this, and they mapped out all these issues. And this is a really good thing to go look at. The problem is, however, they didn't really follow up on it. Right? No one understood what Stoos was, so it wasn't as marketable brand as Agile was. So there wasn't a lot of follow-up on it. The network is fairly dead, although some of them still meet. Um, and there's some limited reference material. But if you're looking for some of the thought process about where leadership needs to go, this is uh, well worth a look. Management 3.0, I didn't know there was a 2.0, but there you go. Management 3.0, this is Jürgen Apello's work. This is kind of uh, uh, management from the Agile perspective. So Jürgen's well known in the Agile uh, community. A uh, lot of techniques and practices in here. Um, I think his workshops are probably the better part of this, which have uh, kind of more recently been documented. Um, but it's all about innovation, morale, um, you know, really cool stuff. Um, problem with this, however, is you need some managers who are going to have some initiative to let you do this kind of stuff. And as I said, the book is very theory-based. The techniques are really in the workshops, um, but those have now been uh, documented, which is well worth a look. So finally, 
I just want to finish off with looking at individuals and interactions. So um, a lot of you may have seen the work by Dan Pink. He wrote a book back in 2009 called Drive. And this was never anything that came from the Agile community, but actually is what we need uh, for Agile to succeed. And focuses really on three things about motivation, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And if you get those, that's where you get engagement. Right? You can't motivate people. People need to be, uh, motivate themselves. It's well regarded. It was a New York Times bestseller. It's got lots of strategies and approaches. It's really awesome. And, and uh, more recently in the Agile community, people have been doing some really cool stuff trying to implement this, which is well worth a look. All right. The downsides, though, however, is if you read into it, the theories are very selective. Right? They've found the theories that back it up, right? and it's, they're fairly obvious. And it's not really directly aligned with us, even though we can kind of use it. But again, if you haven't read the book, or if not, go, read the TED, or go look at the TED Talk. Uh, really cool stuff. The theory of constraints. This is kind of one of the Bibles, and it's you know, kind of interesting that I've left this to number 39. But this is 1984. Eli Goldratty wrote a book called The Goal. It's a very novel-based book. It must be a must-read on your uh, book list if you haven't done it. It talks about the fact that we have to identify the constraints in our organisation that are our weakest link and then build our system around those types of things. So there's a whole bunch of process thinking. Um, it's the basis of so many of the models that Agile is based on um, and is very well regarded. Right? But even though it's so old, some of it is still very theoretical. Right? So if you're looking for something to go and make a name for yourself, right, go jump into this book. There are still things we do, still need to prove out. Well worth a look. And number 40 is something called Kinefin. If you know anything about Kinefin, I just find that diagram really funny. Um, but there's the model there. Um, I think it was a cheese sandwich. Uh, but this is just taking problems and putting them into buckets. It's very well regarded. There's lots of methods in here. If you're trying to do problem solving, you can kind of look at the buckets and go, oh, I understand what that problem is. Should I, should I spend time on it? Should I not? But it can be very hard to understand and apply, right? Uh, the name Kneffen, right? It's Welsh. Dave is Welsh. If you go and watch his video, you have to watch it 17 times to understand what he's saying. Um, but once you actually get past that, it's really cool stuff. The other thing is you do have to put your money uh, hand in your pocket uh, to get to the methods, which is a bit unfortunate. But there's a lot of other things written about it, so well worth a look. There you go, we got to 40. Woo! <laughs> right. What I, what I do want to say, however, is, is that some final thoughts is there's a whole bunch of stuff on the cutting room floor, right? I could have done 280 methods in 280 minutes. You know, things like NVC, domain driven development, RAD, Lean UX, Spiral Dynamics, no estimates, coaching models. There are a whole bunch of them that we didn't even get to here. But hopefully, this is just giving you some things to go look at. The other thing I do want to leave you about is, is that uh, I actually hate the word agile. If we could get rid of it out of the lexicon, I would. I know Dave Thomas is here talking about agile is dead. Um, you know, and I think to a certain extent, he's got some good points. Right? But to me, I think it's just the word has been used wrong. Right. So actually, I'm starting a movement. I want to call it raccoon. <laughs> Why? It's just a word. We shouldn't get hung up on the word so much. And that's really what I want to leave you with is the last one here is the oath of non-allegiance. Right. Because this is really what this talk is about, is this was something popularized by Alistair Coburn back in 2010. And if you just read this here, he says that I promise not to exclude um, from consideration any idea based on its source, but to consider ideas across schools, heritages, in order to find the ones to best suit the current situation. And that really is what those guys on the mountaintop were talking about. Right, let's just find better ways of building software and satisfying our customers. Thank you.